Our guest spot for this unit is with Professor Jeffrey West. Jeffrey is a distinguished professor at the Santa Fe Institute, as well as being the former president of the Institute. He's a theoretical physicist who's worked on many areas related to complex systems, most prominently on scaling phenomena across several disciplines. Earlier in this unit, we discussed his work with Brown, Enquist, and others on metabolic scaling. So welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you, Melanie. Pleasure to be part of this. A lot of people, when they first encounter this field, uh, ask, well, how do you define complexity? And they're often surprised to find that we don't have good definition. So do you think there is going to be ever a single definition of complexity, or is that kind of a misguided goal? Well, I, I would expand that question to ask, uh, you know, it, it, could we ever conceive of a, um, a kind of universal theory of complexity? Complexity or of complex adaptive systems, meaning that, uh, you know, just to, to put it a little more specific, could we imagine a theory that transcends um, um, individual design, individual structure, um, something like thermodynamics, uh, but that also integrates ideas from information theory, from which, in principle, uh, one could fit any complex system, whether it's um, um, an ecosystem, or the economy, or a city, um, or the weather, and so on. And most importantly, could, there be, could that conceptual framework be mathematized in the way that we mathematize, uh, in particular thermodynamics, and lead to ultimately uh, dynamical equations? So that was that is kind of my long-winded answer to is there kind of a precise definition of complexity? Um, I think we have to put that in terms of, you know, is there a definition that can be mathematized? That's the view I take coming out of physics. And uh, my present answer to that is probably not. I've got both sides on this issue, frankly. But my present is, is probably not. But that in no way mitigates against making enormous progress in attacking many of these questions of complex adaptive systems. Okay, interesting. Other people have been more optimistic. <laughs> I their answer, but so there is a lot of disagreement on that issue. Yeah. Um, so we've talked in, our, in this class about scaling, but let me ask you what, in your view, is the importance of studying scaling phenomena? So why is this an important area? Well, I think it's important because, um, as we've already discussed, uh, or at least intimated, you know, how to attack problems, uh, specific problems in, uh, of a complex system which has huge numbers of degrees of freedom, um, and huge, uh, many different levels of, uh, of emergent phenomena and so on. Um, you know, what are the methodologies we can use? And a traditional one in physics, of course, and in science in general, is looking for systematic behavior or regularities and scaling is, I think, at least from my viewpoint, is a tool, just simply a tool, um, a probe, if you like, of the system to see are there any regularities. So asking, you know, taking a specific kind of system and asking how does that, how do its various measurable characteristics change with its size um, provides a potential uh, window onto underlying dynamics, because if you do see a regularity over a large enough range, several orders of magnitude at least, um, if you see that, it says, gee whiz, you know, underlying this extraordinary complexity may be some, uh, I use the word simplicity, I don't mean it quite in the sense I used it before, but maybe some underlying generic principles that are constraining the system to scale in a regular way and the task then is really, and the importance really is, that uh, can we um, understand what an underlying dynamics or the underlying principles are. Okay. Um, so in your own work, uh, we, we've talked in this class about the idea of the three quarters uh, scaling laws, especially uh, in metabolism. Yeah. Um, and there's been some controversy over yeah. that. And you know, for two-thirds versus three-fourths right. versus so on. So can you just quickly summarize what the current state of at least your thinking of that is? Well, uh, several things. First of all, you know, the original data way back, this has been known for 70 odd years, um, unequivocally showed uh, three-quarters. That was the work of Max Kleiber, 
and uh, that was very clear. Uh, then various people, uh, in terms of interpreting it, had this, what I consider, bizarre idea that it must be two-thirds because it's surface to area. Which I say that's bizarre uh, because of the following. First, let me back off to the scaling. There's something extraordinary, whether it's two-thirds or three-quarters or some mixture, that the most complex phenomenon in the universe, probably, maybe life, and maybe metabolism, um, which uh, should scale in a systematic way because each organism, each subsystem of that organism, each organ, each cell type, each genome has, from a traditional Darwinian viewpoint, evolved with its own unique history. It's evolved, uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to be and is historically contingent. Therefore, mm -hmm. you can expect um, that if you were to plot a scaling graph, say metabolic rate versus size, um, you would see huge spread in the data uh, which would be a manifestation of the individual historical contingency. So it would reflect the uh, history of that specific organism or whatever the characteristic is you're looking at. And yet you see extraordinarily systematic behavior. So that's the first point. So seeing scaling is already telling you something is going on that transcends or constrains uh, the, the kind of a naive randomness that we associate with um, uh, natural selection. So, um, where should where would that come from? Where would that uh, kind of regularity come from? Kind of weird to think that it would be surface to area. Hmm. Because what in the hell is Darwinian fitness got to do with having um, you know a, an optimal surface to area? In fact, an optimal surface to area would be a sphere. Mm -hmm. so organisms should approximate a sphere, and there is very little evidence for that except maybe down at the cellular level. Right. This is kind of a weird, I consider this a real, a deep misunderstanding on the part of even biologists who uh, seem to think that that would be a simple explanation. First, so that's the first point. Second point is um, the original data, as I said, uh, it was very close to three quarters. Um, not only that, all of the data that followed it in terms of any other physiological variable, whether it's mundane, like the length of the aorta, or whether it's profound, like how long you live, or growth rate, or diffusion of oxygen across membranes, etc. And there's probably 50 to 75 of such scaling laws. Hmm. There's overwhelmingly a, an exponent, which is some simple multiple of one quarter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this is more evidence. Um, secondly, um, if you look at the metabolic rate of plants, that scales very closely to three quarters, and there's no controversy over that. Hmm. Okay. We did, because of all this, um, we did, um, our little group did, uh, gathered all the possible data you possibly could on measurements of metabolic rates, since people were so focused on that. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, over 2,000 data points. And Van Savage, uh, who was then postdoc here, uh, did the uh, analysis of that, uh, led the analysis of that. And what we found was that um, the, uh, the, the, the scaling exponent was about point, just under 0 0.74, mm -hmm. just all of the data. Mm -hmm. all, what was very clear, and this was known before, um, earlier from the work that led to the people questioning it was that there were deviations um, for, at uh, the level of small animals that veered it towards two-thirds. Now, the other point I want to make is that, um, you know, we um, uh, derived a theory based on networks, which maybe was talked about earlier, I don't know, yes. was based on networks. And so there was a theoretical reason, which also has its controversies, but nevertheless, there was a theoretical um, uh, development that derived the three quarters, right. based on the optimization of networks, and networks are ubiquitous, and the properties that gave rise to that three quarters, and I think this is really important, transcend design of the organism. So it applies mm -hmm. to pulsatile mammalians, it applies down to cells in principles, it applies to plants and so forth. So mm -hmm. 
I find that very compelling because science proceeds by this very close iterative and continuous feedback data, theory, and experiment. And so I can, I, I, you know, the fact that we have a theory that one can, of course, um, uh, uh, look at carefully and uh, ask, is this right or is that this not, is this derivation correct and so on. But to have a theory as a baseline from which to ask these questions, I think, feeds into this question as to what exactly is it. And by the way, one of the great things about that theory is it should, says that there should be deviations from three quarters mm -hmm. because that theory in, in the mathematical language is an asymptotic theory. It's actually correct in the theory. Um, its prediction is for large mammals and mm. tell in principle how that changes as the mammals get smaller and smaller, so much so that it would deviate significantly for small mammals. So do you, do you still feel that the theory is basically right? I think the theory is basically right. There's uh, absolutely. The theory, of course, is very much in the spirit of, um, um, I always liken it to actually the theory like uh, kinetic theory of gases mm -hmm. or the work I've been involved in in the past, the quark model of the elementary particles, where you try to extract from a, you know, a very, rather complex and complicated situation the essential features that you think dominate the problem. So in the kinetic theory of gases, uh, Maxwell in particular postulated that, you know, there were these atoms that were like little billiard balls undergoing elastic collisions, kind mm -hmm. of a, an idea that's kind of loony and is wrong, and I think he even knew they were wrong, but it doesn't matter. He took right. that as the extraction of the dominant feature of what a gas is, and in fact what matter is, and from that derived uh, first of all, the um, ideal gas law, so that's mm -hmm. kind of the analog for the three quarters, and then from that made all kinds of other predictions, uh, some of which were quite startling, and people attacked him for it. And one of them was, for example, the viscosity of the gas should be independent of its, of its pressure. Mm -hmm. He also made predictions that people didn't believe in, and this is often forgotten in this, and one of the things that we predicted was that the metabolic rate of cells in vivo should decrease um, as mass to the one quarter as you increase the size of the organism. But that if you looked at it in vitro, mm -hmm. come out and you cultured them, they would all migrate, whether it's a mouse or an elephant or a whale or a human being, they would all migrate to the same level. Mm. And uh, they would all have this because, this was a network theory, and when you re release the cells from the control of the network, so this is totally anti-reductionistic, you release the cells from the network, they all migrate to the same value, and the theory predicts what that value should be, as well as this in vivo behavior of mass to the minus one quarter. And uh, we were attacked for that, actually. Mm. So, and then someone did a dedicated experiment and showed that it was correct. So it's, I think, one of the biggest successes of the theory. Okay, well, thanks. On intuitive. Um, one last question, so a little bit d different topic. It, a lot of students have asked um, how they can get started in the field of complex systems that, you know, that there's so many different fields and there's so much that you have to know. So do you have any advice for people? Yes, that's a very tough question, and it, and it brings up a broader question. You know, people talk about being trained in uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary studies, and one should maybe start that as an undergraduate level and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's like the definition of complexity. I've got both sides of this issue. I've actually come down uh, in, in my older years to the idea that actually I like the idea of a student being trained in a discipline mm -hmm. should found the basis from which you then use something with deep knowledge and then move into these other other areas and in particular into issues of complexity but in, but so so that's my first point first point is i think i think it's good to be grounded in a discipline what's called a discipline anyway but that grounding and that education and this is the problem now with universities needs to have gray, gray edges. That is, you know, I think that part of that education needs to allow diffusion across boundaries. Mm -hmm. But 
I think one of the real difficulties is there aren't serious courses in complexity, or there are a few of them around and being developed. And one of the things I'm so delighted with what you're trying to do is, in fact, put this on the map so that people actually can use the knowledge they already have learned within a discipline and uh, some of the diffusion into other things to start being exposed to many of these different ideas and techniques that have been developed by many researchers, many associated with the Santa Fe Institute and in many other places to think about these kinds of questions. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure, Bella. Good luck with this. Thanks.